I understand. It's a uh, hard losing a friend. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for Rick and Morty characters who took a one-way portal to the other side. Since we're talking about deaths that are potentially significant, there is a spoiler alert. So this is Vindicators 3? And you guys did Vindicators 2 without us? I sense insecurity. Number 20, Story Lord. Voiced by Paul Giamatti, Story Lord is a formidable opponent of Rick who is able to manipulate storytelling devices against the scientist. Story Lord, I should have known you were behind this, and I did. Who is this guy? Ugh, he's like a Matrix space Frasier. Like the Tickets Please guy, he has a cut physique and strong fighting skills. A pompous figure who is fixated on story structure, Story Lord's motivations revolve around literary categories such as breaking the fifth wall and seeking the world's supply of motivation. Yes! I can feel it! I'm so motivated! I want a lot! However, the villain meets his end in Full Metal Jack Rick after fighting Rick in a rematch where he's smothered by cheap merchandise. Talk about poetic justice. Number 19, Slow Mobius. We first see Slow Mobius in the season one finale, Rixy Business, where he attends Rick's house party as a guest. Knock it off, Slow Mobius! Oh, sorry, dude! I'm just trying to show off my powers, bro! At first, he looks like a minor throwaway character, but in Unmort Rickon, it's revealed that the time dilator is Rick's uncle that he loves dearly. Unfortunately, Rick Prime kidnaps Slow Mobius and kills him across all dimensions to get a rise out of Rick. Where am I? Two Ricks? Where's my wife? I was just with my wife! Uncle Slow! What the f Uncle Slow? Slow Mobius? Yeah, this one hurts me too. After Slow's passing, his wife goes out looking for him before meeting someone else and moving on, which shows the lives that Slow Mobius' death impacted. Number 18, Jerry Smith Prime. This is the version of Jerry from season one that lives in the universe the Cronenberg monsters take over. We see Jerry Prime go from a cowardly, whiny man-baby to a resourceful action hero. Looking for this? What are you doing with that? It stinks of Rick. No! Why? Why would you do that? What, what, what is the matter with you people? The remarkable thing about Jerry Prime is this is what Jerry could have been if the comforts of society hadn't kept him complacent. However, the tragedy of the apocalypse takes its toll on Jerry, as he loses Beth and Summer and is forced to learn how to go on without them. Well, with no one left to blame, I finally had to deal with myself. Buried my grief at Barnes & Noble. Four agreements, eat, pray, love, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. Learn to accept things for what they are. Sadly, in the post credit scene for Solarix, Rick Prime kills off Jerry. But at least Jerry gets a dignified death. For a Jerry. Number 17, King Jellybean. Morty comes across this royal anthropomorphic candy in the bathroom. Though he appears nice and supportive at first, Jellybean shows his true colors as a predator when he forces himself on Morty. Everything's going fine. I just gotta relax and go with the flow. Yeah. Immediately after the assault, Morty acts traumatized around Rick, who is able to figure out what happened to his grandson. When Rick and Morty come across Jellybean again, Rick takes the opportunity to assassinate the king for what he did. No, it's cool. Rick Portal, hurry. <laughs> Jellybean was an example of the random dark humor of Rick and Morty, embodying something that is both absurd and sinister at the same time. Number 16, Roy. Unlike other characters on this list, Roy is a fictional character within the show, as he's the main character of an arcade game at Blips and Chits. Here, check this out. Roy, what's wrong? I had a nightmare. I was with an old man. He put a helmet on me. It's just a fever. Get some sleep. In the game, the player is put in a simulation where he gets to inhabit the life of an ordinary man named Roy and is faced with the kind of decisions everyone has to make in life. As Morty plays the game, convinced this is his reality after Rick slipped the headset on him, we see the ups and downs of Roy's life as it unfolds, with the disappointing heartbreaks and his harrowing bout with cancer. I'm not ready to die. You're not going to. Yeah! Yeah! Roy might not have been real, but he touched our hearts with his story. Number 15, The Council of Ricks. 
This panel of six different Ricks oversees the operations of the Citadel, where even more versions of Rick and Morty live. What is this place? The Citadel of Ricks. It's the secret headquarters for the Council of Ricks. Council of Ricks? Among the priorities of the Council was maintaining bureaucratic order and protecting the Citadel from various threats, including the Galactic Federation and Rick C-137. When they make the mistake of kidnapping Morty and Summer, Rick dispatches the group, which was all part of an elaborate plan to get rid of all his enemies in one fell swoop. W what the hell is that? Payback. Grandpa Rick! Duh. You're alive! Rick! Morty, take this! After the demise of the Council's members, there was a power vacuum in the Citadel that was later filled when evil Morty became president. Number 14, Crombopolis Michael. An assassin who bought weapons from Rick, Crumbopolis Michael was not like other contract killers. He was very open about his profession and kept a very public profile. Hi, Morty. I'm Crumbopolis Michael. I'm an assassin. I buy guns from your grandpa. Ugh, here, go away. Ooh, yeah, this looks deadly. Voiced by Andy Daly, Michael had an upbeat personality and was very passionate about his life's work. Sadly, Morty, bothered by the ethical qualms of Rick doing business with this figure, crashed into Michael to prevent him from killing his target. You have arrived at Crombopulous. Michael, your destination is below. However, what Morty did not know was that by keeping Crombopolis Michael from killing his target, he was aiding a more dangerous entity. Number 13, the Zygerians. An alien race known for their scams, the Zygerians were trying to fool Rick into giving away his formula for concentrated dark matter. You're inside a simulation of a simulation inside another giant simulation. <laughs> we never had the recipe for concentrated dark matter, but we do now. We do now, sucka! The leader, voiced by David Cross, is a petty jerk as only Cross can bring to life. To fool Rick, they set up simulations that gradually get more intricate and make the audience question what the reality within the episode really is. At first, it looks like the Zygerians were successful in their confidence game, but Rick was just tricking them into destroying themselves with cold indifference because they annoyed him. What the hell? What, what happened back there? Why don't you ask the smartest people in the universe, Jerry? Oh yeah, you can't. They blew up. Number 12, Miles Knightley. An alien master of the heisting arts, Miles Knightley steals something before Rick does, angering the genius scientist. The calling card from Miles Knightley, a heist artist, aka a hipster dick whose adventures are 60% putting a crew together and 40% revealing that the robbery already happened. To get back at Knightley, Rick decides to crash HeistCon, where Knightley is presenting. After challenging Rick to a heist off, Knightley reveals that he stole Rick's crew and performed the theft already. However, Rick one-ups him and then some by revealing that he used a robot programmed with a heist algorithm to hypnotize not only Knightley's crew, but also the entire convention. So I'm in your crew now. Yeah, well, you're in good company, right everybody? Yes. My God. Despite hating heist movies, Rick proves incredibly adept at using their tropes. A little too much, actually. After ordering the audience to steal the convention itself, they proceed to rip Miles Knightley apart. Your next big score? Steal every square inch of heist con! We don't think there's gonna be a switcheroo on this twist. All right, look, Morty, I did not know that that was gonna happen. That's not on me. Come on, Morty, let's go. Number 11, j -Fith. When Rick asks Morty to retrieve wine he left in a dimension where time moves much faster, like Narnia, Morty runs into a dog cow man named Hoovy. Hoovy, dinner's ready. Be right there, sugar hoof. Just helping this young man through a portal with that crate full of alcohol that's been here for decades. Hey, thanks, Hoovy. I, I really appreciate that. Hoovy accidentally follows Morty through his time dimension. Upon returning, he finds his wife dead, and his son Japheth immediately kills him for leaving. It wasn't my fault. Who's then? Who's? The boy from the magic door. As sad as Hoovy's death is, his son's life ends up being more impactful. After attacking Morty in revenge when he returns, Japheth then grows old and has sons of his own, who don't believe his stories of the boy and the door. Morty ends up beating him up so much his life gives out. I'm sorry, Father. I'm sorry we never believed. He'll come back! Stop him! Stop him! With his dying words, Japheth sets his sons and their whole society against Morty. 
Talk about a grudge. Number 10, the decoys. In the episode Morty Plicity, Rick created decoys of the entire Smith family, who in turn made decoys, who in turn made decoys, etc. You said decoys didn't make decoys. And usually they don't, but again, it's nothing to worry about because decoys are harmless. Just have to, you know, visit the rest and terminate the program. The entire episode is a fakeout where we're led to believe we're seeing the Smith family, only for it to be revealed to be decoys who are brutally murdered. It's depressing to see the anguish some of the decoys go through when they find out they're not real. Where are we going? Off grid, Morty. We're gonna live in the woods like libertarians. We'll hunt rabbits and trade with like little pieces of gold bar that we cut off with a knife. That licks. We might be decoys summer. Everything about this licks. Oh, maybe some of the decoys, which are sloppy decoys made by other decoys, have interesting designs such as the scarecrow decoy or the ones made out of wood. Number nine, most of the Vindicators. A galactic superhero team, the Vindicators are by any other measure a powerful and successful group. However, they made the mistake of asking Rick for help against their nemesis, World Ender. Whoa, Rick! Is that the Vindicator Beacon? We're being called to assemble by the Vindicators! I refuse to answer a literal call to adventure, Morty. Let it go to voicemail! Rick gets drunk and proceeds to defeat him while in a stupor, then has time to lay Saw-style traps and puzzles for the superheroes in World Ender's lair. Rick, is, is this a Saw thing? Are you seriously sawing the Vindicators? Morty, I'm a drunk, not a hack. Although a few of them are taken out by these, the rest end up killing each other after the stressful situation brings out their inner conflicts. Only one, Supernova, manages to survive the outing. Still, we may not have seen the last of the group, even if most of them are gone. Rick, Supernova's getting away! Eh, who cares? But she was trying to kill us! Morty, 20 people try to kill me every week. Number 8. Tickets, please, guy. Tickets, please. On a metaphysical story train, Rick and Morty encounter plenty of colorful characters, including an older man who takes their tickets when they're in disguise. Upon encountering them again, the Tickets Please guy proves surprisingly buff and adept at using a human shield. Tickets, please. Dude, I'm sure you've got, like, so many tickets at this point. Rick blows out the window of the train, causing Tickets Please guy to be cut in half. Structural breach. Losing continuity. Morty, hold on to something. Keep your head inside. While his mind wakes up in another reality, his bodily injuries soon catch up to him leading to him being in constant agony across both realities and even inspiring a religion in one. I mean, are you real? Is life real? Okay, I'm calling the nurse because you are not doing this tonight. You're goddamn right I'm not You are not doing this tonight! Ultimately, Morty puts Tickets Please Guy out of his misery, though it may have also led to the death of a whole reality too. Happy now? He was suffering! Number 7. Armathy in order to distract the denizens of a post-apocalyptic dimension, Rick injects muscle memory and fighting experience from a dead man's arm into Morty's arm. I'm working with a mixed bag here, so you may not have perfect coordination, Morty. Oh, hey! I, I didn't do that! This makes Morty's arm not only a powerful killing implement, but also semi-autonomous and intelligent. While Morty uses the arm, which he dubs Armathy, to vent his frustrations about his parents' divorce by competing in a blood dome, Armathy seeks to find the ones who killed his wife and kids. What's the matter, you piece of crap? Have you ever watched your family burn to death before? <laughs> now I'm gonna whip you. With Morty's help, the two reach the man ultimately responsible, and Armathy apparently kills him before fading away like a ghost. Maybe the lesson we've learned is that whether it's our parents' marriage, a glowing green rock, or an awesome giant arm, sooner or later, we gotta let it go. While his unfinished business has to be finished by Morty, the duo's bizarre friendship was still entertaining while it lasted. Number 6. Gordon Lunas When Rick and Morty decide to look through memories Rick removed from his grandson's mind, we meet Gordon Lunas. Wow, that's incredible! What the heck? In this memory, Morty looks through a telescope at the moon, only to see a sinister man with a mustache in mid-stride on the moon who looks back at him. No one believes him, and the next day, Morty is disturbed to see the man, Gordon Lunas, is now his school guidance counselor. Kids, I'd like to introduce you all to our new guidance counselor, Mr. Lunas. I look forward to helping guide you all towards a brighter future. I believe every student should shoot for the moon. Morty goes to his principal about it, who believes that Morty means Lunas is a deviant. After he confronts Lunas with it, Morty is horrified to find that Lunas has taken his own life, and that what he saw on the telescope was just a smudge. This is just awful for everyone involved. Oh my god, what have I done? 
What have I done? Number five, alien parasites. We could be infested with these things, so we gotta keep an eye out for any zany, wacky characters that pop up. Ooh wee! Whatever you want, Rick, we're here to help. The Smith family house becomes infested with alien parasites. This isn't anything out of the ordinary for them, but the twist is these parasites insert memories of themselves into their victims' brains, making them believe they're trusted friends or family. Rick, these are our family and friends, the people we barbecue with. Have you forgotten the barbecue? This leads to plenty of amusing flashbacks of their adventures with the family and to a lot of great character designs and concepts. I figured it out, Rick! The parasites can only create pleasant memories. I know you're real because I have a ton of bad memories with you. Eventually, Eventually, Morty figures out that they can only create happy memories, leading to a massacre of everyone they love the most. While we still weep for Penn Sylvester, none of us was hit nearly as hard as Jerry was by the loss of Sleepy Gary. Number 4. Tony When Rick discovers someone has been using his special toilet, he's understandably furious. Time to meet your maker. He goes to great lengths to find the culprit, and it turns out to be Tony, a soft-spoken office worker and widower. Although Rick decides against killing him, he still tries to rebuff Tony. However, Tony continues using Rick's toilet and is unfazed by his threats. You need the same thing I needed, Rick. You need someone to give you <clears throat> permission to live. What the? I thought you were a shy pooper. You know what shy pooping is, Rick. It's a pointless bid for control. Even a simulation of the afterlife isn't enough to deter him. Rick's simulation pushes Tony to live his life to the fullest, which he does, before tragically dying while skiing on Space Everest. Tony died. Excuse me? He quit his job, started living life to the fullest. He crashed into a tree space skiing down Mount Space Everest. Tony's death is so sad because he was just a nice guy who wanted to be Rick's friend. Rick might have enjoyed his company if he weren't too busy pushing him away. Number 3. Fart when Morty decides to stop an assassin Rick sells a gun to, he saves the life of a green, bejeweled cloud, whom Rick nicknames Fart. Oh, good job, Morty. You, you, you killed my best customer, but you saved a mind-reading fart. I like this name, Fart. The telepathic gas is fond of singing and creating psychedelic montages in people's heads. Although it proves surprisingly effective in getting them out of jams, ultimately it wants to return to its own kind through a wormhole. Morty is so sad to see it go. At least until it reveals that it plans to return to kill all carbon-based life in the universe. Carbon-based life is a threat to all higher life. To us, you are what you would call a disease. Wherever we discover you, we cure it. You said yourself that life must be protected even through sacrifice. With much regret, Morty kills Fart. It's one of the first times Morty takes a life on purpose and marks a major development in his character. Goodbye. Goodbye, innocence, and goodbye, moon men. Goodbye. Number 2. Tammy Guterman Tammy Guterman seemed like just the average high school girl who fell for Rick's best bud, Bird Person. However, she turned out to be a galactic undercover agent that killed her new husband. Tammy, what are you doing? Sit your bird ass down! While Bird Person's death hits hard, he does come back as Phoenix Person. When Rick finally comes into conflict with Tammy again, it's because she's chasing one of Rick's daughters, Beth, one of the Beths, who may or may not be a clone. Wait, so there are two of them. Anyway, when both Beths are kidnapped, Tammy has Rick at gunpoint when Morty and Summer come to the rescue, allowing Rick to shoot Tammy dead in revenge for making him go to a wedding. Also for killing his bestie. You made me go to a wedding. Still, Tammy proves useful, even in death. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Rick Prime This version of Rick is possibly the most evil and dangerous one of all. In addition to killing Jerry Prime and Slow Mobius, as previously mentioned, he also killed Rick C-137's wife, Diane. Diane was wiped from all existence by the weapon too cool for a name. The Omega Device. Known to inferiors as the Omega Device. I heard the name from an inferior. And it's my weapon, but it's your fault I had to use it on her. He's also highly skilled, killing Ricks out of boredom and having developed a device that can wipe out a person's existence across all dimensions of the multiverse. 
for more than a season. Rick C-137 was obsessed with trying to find Rick Prime and get revenge for ruining his life, only for Rick Prime to mock him for failing to do so. After teaming up with Evil Morty, Rick C-137 is finally able to get his revenge by brutally beating Rick Prime to a fatal pulp. Nip this in the bud! He's 14! What's gonna happen the next time he gets mad at Grandpa? <laughs> Let's do this then! Do you like the new voice actors that took over for Justin Roiland? Let us know in the comments. Oh wee, things went downhill from there. So I've been crashing with the Smiths for a while. Oh wee! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.